I am Dr. Lincoln Nadal, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome you to today's educational activity titled, Ahead of the Game, Updates in Multi-Cancer Early Detection Tests. Today's program is sponsored by an educational grant from GRAIL Incorporated. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning, jointly accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. I also want to encourage everyone to join us today on our live Twitter conversation at CME Outfitters. We will be monitoring the Twitter feed and responding to your tweets as they come in. One last item, I want you to note that we are using an enhanced platform today that allows you to save slides, take notes on slides, answer polling questions, and send us your questions. So please look at the tabs on the left of your screen and give us your feedback on the program and on the platforms as well. We look forward, we look forward to your comments. Again, I am Dr. Lincoln Nadal, Vice President and Chief of Precision Health and Academics at Intermountain Healthcare. And today I'm your host. I'd like to welcome to the presentation today, our faculty. We have two and I'll allow them to introduce themselves, Dr. Tom Beer and Dr. John Russell. Tom? Hi, I'm Tom Baer. I'm a medical oncologist um, at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, I take care of folks with prostate cancer and in recent years have developed a, a real interest in clinical research into cancer early detection. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Thanks, Dr. Baer. Great to have you. Dr. Russell. I'm John Russell. I'm a clinical professor of family and community medicine at the Thomas Jefferson University Sydney, Sydney Kimmel uh, Medical College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm also a family medicine residency program director and chair at Jefferson Abington Hospital. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you, Dr. Russell. It's really a pleasure to have both you and Dr. Bear here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So the learning objectives for today's activity are listed here. Number one, explain the benefits and limitations of the current cancer screening approach. And we'll have information on that. Learning objective two, assess the emerging multi-cancer early detection tests in development. And number three, recognize the clinical considerations regarding emerging blood tests for cancer detection. So those are your learning objectives. And before we begin, let's start with a quick polling question. You can answer using your uh, screens there. In thinking, here's the question. In thinking about all cancer types, what portion of all cancers are covered under existing cancer screening guidelines? And you can see the uh, possible answers there. Is it 25% approximately, 45%, 65%, or 85%? And you can also say, I'm not sure. So think about that. Enter your answer. Okay, doctor, do you see the results? I'm not seeing results. Okay, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna advance the results right now. You should see the graph on the left there. So it looks like we have 28% for 25, we have 30% for 45, 10% for 65, 5% for 85, and 27% said they're not sure. So Dr. Russell, what do you make of those responses? It, uh, it seems like people are glad that they came tonight. I think people aren't really <laughs> sure. And I probably a lot of our audience does a lot of cancer screening. So hopefully we'll be able to answer this question a little better for everyone by the end of the evening. Agreed. Dr. Bear, any surprises here? Oh, I, I, I think uh, folks recognize that most cancers aren't covered and it's just a matter of figuring out which of the low numbers to pick. Well, uh, the audience is in luck. This is uh, the topic of the evening. We'll talk all about uh, existing cancer screening guidelines and um, 
uh, additional opportunities for multi-cancer screening. So let's jump into that. Uh, as many attendees may be aware, cancer remains the second most common cause of death for all U.S. residents. And you can see in the graph there that there have been some gains in mortality, some improvements in mortality, and yet cancer remains the second leading cause of death. So a real challenge, and this has been true for many decades now, ever since uh, we declared the war on cancer in the early 70s and uh, have been focusing on this as a research topic all across the United States and globally. So John, let's, let's go to you. You know, screening has been such a big part of reducing cancer mortality. We've made gains largely on the backs of our uh, improved cancer screening efforts. Can you talk to us about some of the principles that underlie the development of effective screening tools? Absolutely, and I think this is so, so critical. And I was talking with my residents about newborn screening tests, and it's the same concepts. So the condition should be an important health problem. Cancer, absolutely. The natural history of the condition include development from late, latent to declared disease should be adequately understood. We know that for most cancers. There should be a recognizable latent or early symptomatic stage. Yes, there should be a suitable test or examination, and we're gonna talk about some new tests. This, the test should be acceptable to the population. You know, would a blood test be acceptable compared to some of the other things? There should be an agreed upon policy on who to treat. There should be an accepted treatment for patients with recognized diseases. Facilities for diagnosis and treatment should be available. The cost of case finding, including diagnosis and treatment, should be economically balanced in relation to possible expenditure. And case finding should be a continuing process. We should continue to reevaluate our screening methodologies. So if you look at the cancers we look at in the United States, in men, our top three cancers, excluding skin cancers, lung and bronchus, prostate, colon and rectum. But if you look at the bottom six, none of these are cancers that we screen for. Pancreas, liver, leukemia, esophagus, bladder, not Hodgkin's lymphoma, or brain tumors. And, all, and if you look in women, about the same story, but it's lung, breast, colon and rectum, and then the rest. So the, the majority of the cancers, over half the cancers that we uh, deal with in the United States, we don't screen for. Only, so 45% really is that correct answer that we're looking to, uh, looking to find. So I'm going to go through four of the cancers that we screen for and just talk about the guidelines. So the United States Preventative Service Task Force about lung cancer. So our number one cause of cancer death in the United States is lung cancer screening. We should have annual screening for adults age 50 to 80 who have a 20 plus pack year smoking history and currently smoke or have quit within the last 15 years. Well, those guidelines just changed. The screening eligibility in 2013 only got 14%. The new one should get 21 to 24%. Well, what has changed is that number has gone from 55 to 50 and that pack year has gone from 20 to 30 because partly we didn't have equity because certain populations in the United States don't smoke as many cigarettes. Um, so this new, screening this new screening paradigm will capture more African-American, Hispanic, indigenous North American folks. Hopefully it will lead to more lung cancer deaths prevented and life years gained. Um, and we know with lung cancer, the earlier you find a lung cancer, the better chance that we are going to have to have someone survive. Colon cancer screening, we should screen all adults age 45 to 75. Um, we have lots of different choices. We could do a high sensitivity guaiac fecal occult blood test or FIT every year, a stool DNA FIT test every one to three years. We could do a CT colonography uh, every five years, a flex SIG every five years, a flex SIG every 10 years, plus an annual FIT or a colonoscopy every 10 years. And we should screen people up until the age of 75. And then 75 to 85, we can kind of decide well, which patients are gonna benefit most from being screened. Well, if we look to see who gets screened in the United States, we are only capturing about roughly about 70% of our population, more women than men. With advancing age, we get these numbers higher. Uh, there are some disparities in different uh, ethnic groups in the United States. And the more education you have in the United States, the more likely you are to be screened. Moving on to breast cancer. And again, with colon cancer, the earlier we find a colon cancer, the more likely that our patient is to survive. Um, 
breast cancer, if we look at breast cancer screening recommendations, if you look at the recommendations between 40 and 49 years of age, you have everything from annual screening in women from the American Academy of Family Physicians to the ACP saying screening mammography is discouraged. Uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, screening mammography discouraged. American College of Radiology, annual mammography. So even for something that we all think is tried and true, even the governing bodies can't collectively figure out what they're gonna recommend for screening. If we look at women between 50 and 74 years of age, anywhere from annual to biennial mammography is recommended. Again, if we find a local breast cancer, that woman is going to survive. If the breast cancer has spread and there are distant uh, metastases, that patient is not gonna do as well. And when we see who is up to date with breast cancer screening in the United States, uh, again, with advancing age, it increases. Um, one of the things overall for breast cancer screening, there aren't great recommendations about ages to stop. You know, Some of the other recommendations I went over had a stop age. Breast cancer really doesn't across the board. Again, there are variations between groups. Um, there are variations between um, uh, gay, lesbian versus straight uh, patients. And the more education that you have, the more likely you are to have, have some screening. Uh, and looking at prostate cancer uh, screening guidelines, and this is a very controversial uh, screening, whether we should screen at all. Um, the United States Preventive Service Task Force says we should not screen uh, with PSA-based screening in men under the age of 55 or over the age of 70. And between 55 and 70, we should have a discussion with patients on what are their some preferences, what are the pros and cons of doing PSA screening. And overall, we're only screening about 40% of the population when we look at this. And you know, the older you are, the more likely you are to be screened. There are some differences between groups. Uh, the patients who live above the poverty level more likely to be screened and the patients with more education. So I think even the screening that we do, we can't completely agree on uh, all the recommendations. Certainly there are patients who are left out of the recommendations and hopefully we can look at some new paradigms tonight that maybe we can kind of plug some of these gaps. Lincoln. Thanks, John. Boy, that's such a great review. You know, um, we're left with these controversies. You highlighted some of them and, uh, you know, we have a few cancers that are covered with current um, screening tests that are available. Uh, but th these questions arise, who do we screen? You know, what, what tests are we supposed to use? How do we interpret these results? Uh, you know, using breast cancer is such a great example. When do we start that kind of screening? There was a recent change in colon cancer screening. Uh, when, when to start, at what age? And how often do we do that? And, and so on. So and I, think uh, one of the, I think one of the issues is we have patients who do everything right. They, they follow every recommendation that we give to them and they still develop cancers and they still develop often facial cancers. And they're like, doc, what did I do wrong? And they're le and we don't have great answers for them. And then, you know, John, do you ever run into this where a patient says, well, uh, you know, my family member or my neighbor, neighbor was diagnosed with cancer X, can I be screened for that? I mean, that happens all the time. And, you know, it would be good to have some, you know, some better answers. Shared decision-making is what I do all day. So if I had something else that I had some shared decision-making, but I think we would feel a little less helpless when patients ask us questions along those lines. Yeah, I, I run into that. You know, I'm, I'm on the medical oncology side. And so I see patients largely after they've been diagnosed and they come in and they want to know what they did wrong. And of course they didn't do anything wrong, um, but they want to know how they or their loved ones could avoid uh, falling into a similar situation. And, and that really lies at the heart of the promise of multi-cancer early detection. So a lot of these less common cancers don't have screening tests available. And pancreatic cancer is a great example, ovarian cancer, um, esophageal cancers, uh, et cetera. And, and so patients want to know, how can I be screened for this kind of cancer that I'm worried about, either because of my family history or because of something that I've read. And historically, we have not had uh, great answers. And this is where multi-cancer detection tests uh, could really make a difference. So let's ask our audience now, 
an additional question along those lines. And uh, here it is, you can see it on your screens. I'll ask Dr. Uh, Russell and Dr. Bear to help interpret these results, but here's the question. What type of biomarker is most effective for detecting multiple types of cancer from a single blood sample? So you're drawing blood and you want it, and the question is, what is the biomarker in that blood that is gonna be most effective for detecting multiple cancer types? The, oper the possible answers are DNA mutations via next generation sequencing, protein sets, RNA and or multi, uh, microsatellite DNA in circulating cancer cells, DNA methylation patterns, or you can select, I'm not sure. So let's take a minute and let our audience answer. So, Dr. Russell, what what, are, what do you make of the results? I, I think uh, I think a lot of people came to this talk tonight to try to learn more about this, and I'm I'm not sure people kind of know how the sausage is made, so to speak. So I think people are really mostly unsure, and the, the rest of the answers are kind of mixed in between. So I think it's it's a good thing we're here tonight. Yeah, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, you know, in the in the polling question, we presented uh, a variety of biomarkers, and um, you know, it, it raises the question, and it's important for ordering physicians and treating providers to understand uh, what it is. What is the what is the science behind this test that I'm ordering for my patients? I would like to understand that. So let's talk about it. Could you tell us a little bit about um, some of these biomarkers and um, how they could be used for multi-cancer early detection? And is there a best one? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I would have, uh, um, I would have picked, uh, I'm not sure, uh, had I answered that polling question. And that's because, you know, we are really uh, at a time when there's a, a lot of research uh, underway and a lot of different approaches are being evaluated. So it is true that DNA methylation patterns serve as the basis for um, the Galeri test from GRAIL, which has uh, uh, recently been made clinically available on a limited basis uh, and uh, could be viewed as the leading test in the field. But CancerSeq, which is another uh, approach that's being evaluated in large-scale clinical trials, relies on a combination of protein biomarkers and mutational analysis. And um, uh, you know, there's a variety of other potential biomarkers that are in um, uh, early stage development. So I think you can see all of them and time will tell which ones emerge uh, as the most useful and we may see combinations. One of the, the unique features of DNA methylation patterns is that they enable us to predict the tissue or organ of origin pretty well. So when one gets a blood-based uh, cancer early detection test, one can not only get a cancer, no cancer signal, but also a a strong suggestion as to where to look. So that's an advantage of the methylation-based tests. And I'm gonna jump in and, and talk a bit about all these things and um, start with this slide as an introduction. So when we think about these blood-based tests, sometimes they're referred to as so-called liquid biopsies. And for those of us practicing in the oncology space, we've really grown pretty accustomed to using these tests. Uh, we, we use them in patients with established cancer for things like detecting minimal residual disease, monitoring response to therapy, monitoring the evolution of cancer. And at the beginning, um, uh, characterizing the molecular makeup of cancers, which can, can be done using both tissue and blood specimens that analyze circulating tumor DNA. So we're pretty used to now in the last several years, uh, these blood-based tests and the management of cancer, but for early detection of cancer, they're really just beginning uh, to emerge. And so I wanted to um, uh, share with you a couple of recent results um, that have uh, from large scale prospective studies that have looked at leading multi-cancer early detection tests. And I'm going to start with this uh, study of the CancerSeq test. The CancerSeq test was uh, an outgrowth of work done at Johns Hopkins uh, and um, combines a uh, set of known mutations with a set of known protein biomarkers 
into a, a multi-omic panel. In this study, uh, if over 10,000 women ages 65 to 75 were recruited uh, and evaluated using the cancer seek test. Now, uh, the study chose women because although this is a multi-cancer uh, test, the investigators were particularly interested in ovarian cancer. And they focused on women ages 65 to 75 because in that age group, it was felt that the risk of cancer was greatest and yet participants would be young enough to potentially benefit from screening. So that, those are the reasons for the population studied. And you can read the report here is the journal article from the journal Science uh, that was published last year. So it's available to you in the literature. Um, the testing process is spelled out here. Now, this version of CancerSeq uh, does not have an organ of origin identification. Uh, by virtue of looking for mutations, it can also occasionally detect mutations that are not related to an underlying cancer, but related to uh, benign abnormalities such as so-called CHIP or clonal hematopoiesis. And so the test is a two-stage test where the baseline test looks for the mutations or protein biomarkers and uh, uh, an abnormal result prompts a second analysis of that blood sample for a conform confirmatory test. And only of the confirmatory test, which rules out uh, CHIP, um, uh, yields a, a confirming result, then patients are told uh, of an abnormal result and a cancer evaluation is initiated. And in this case, because there's no organ of origin signal, all patients were evaluated with a PET CT scan. And all participants um, in this study were followed for a full 12 months, received standard cancer screening tests during that period of time, uh, as well as routine follow-up care. This slide uh, summarizes graphically the results of this study. Um, 9,911 women participated, 490 had a positive baseline test and 127 had a positive result on both tests. So uh, overall the cancer seek uh, test identified 127 of women with a suspicion of cancer. Out of those 26 cancers were diagnosed and you can see here graphically what kinds of cancers those were. They, they, they did include ovarian cancer as the authors had hoped, but also lung cancer, kidney, colorectal, uh, uterine, appendiceal, lymphoma, et cetera. So broad range of, uh, of types of cancer. Um, uh, about 101 participants ended up being deemed to have a false positive result on cancer seek and underwent imaging uh, for that. Now, interestingly, along with the 26 cancers that were diagnosed through the cancer seek test, during the subsequent year of observation, 24 additional cancers were detected with routine screening, and 46 additional cancers beyond that were detected in the course of clinical care. And that, that might be surprising at first glance, but when one looks at the types of cancers we're talking about, it becomes less surprising. There are certain types of early stage cancers, such as, um, uh, for example, uh, endometrial cancer, which was a common finding amongst those that are clinically detected, that really doesn't spill a lot of biomarkers into the blood at its early stages, and often presents with a symptom, in this case, vaginal bleeding. And so one would expect to detect things like early stage bladder cancer, early stage um, endometrial uterine cancer, uh, potentially clinically. And of course, the 24 cancers detected with routine screening would have largely been breast cancer. This is a busy table with a test performance for cancer seek. I'd call your attention primarily to the right-hand column, and you can see that the positive predictive value of this test was approaching 20%. That means 20% of signal positive women had a cancer and 80% did not. That was a product of a high specificity at 98.9%. The negative predictive value was 99.3%. Sensitivity for all cancers was 27%. And for cancers without standard of care screening was 31%. So that gives you a bit of a baseline on what a test like this can do. Now, turning our attention to the other test, um, the Galeri test from GRAIL uh, focuses, on the other hand, on DNA methylation patterns. 
DNA methylation is a process that uh, attaches methyl groups to DNA and by doing so silence, silences the expression of those target genes. It is unique in each organ and tissue in the body and it is unique in cancers. And so those patterns can be used both to identify uh, the possibility of having a cancer and also to identify the organ of origin. Prior studies uh, evaluated um, the GRAIL multi-cancer early detection test across a range of tumor types. The font on the slide is quite small, so I apologize for that. But I think it gives you a sense that the sensitivities differ by cancer type. Uh, and it's not surprising because the, uh, some of the cancers that we're looking at on the right-hand side where the sensitivity is very high, esophageal, head and neck, multiple myeloma, uh, ovarian pancreatic cancer. Those cancers tend to spill DNA into the blood early, whereas cancers such as thyroid, early stage prostate, kidney, skin cancers, and so on and so forth, tend not to spill a lot of DNA in the blood. So there will be some differences in the sensitivity of this test, particularly for early stages of a variety of cancers. Gratifyingly, the sensitivity for some of the very aggressive cancers for which we don't currently have screening tests for uh, was quite good. Hey, so with uh, that, yes. let me just interrupt you right there. So, you know, one of the questions that came up in the chat is, does histology or tumor vascularization play a role in, in these tests? And, you know, I don't know that you can conclude that decisively from a slide like this, but um, you, you kind of alluded to it in some of these cancers, you know, dumping their DNA into the bloodstream early. Do you have any thoughts on a question like that? Yeah, so at this point, you know, there's enough data to look by cancer histology overall, cancer type. But if the question is about within a cancer type is a, uh, a variety of, you know, a, a cancer that's more vascularized or some, some, somehow histologically distinct, will it spill more DNA into the blood or not? I, I think the answer is probably yes, that's likely to be the case. But at this point, we don't have enough data, uh, uh, and I don't believe that's been looked at with this test. So that's a question for the future. But it certainly makes sense that to the extent these assays depend on DNA spillage into the blood, there's going to be a host of factors uh, that drive that. Great. Thank you for that question. So um, uh, here, I just wanted to brief you on the study that, that we were uh, privileged to be a part of. This is the Pathfinder study, and it was um, uh, one of the first uh, studies of, uh, just like the, uh, the Cancer Seek study, one of the first studies that returned results to patients with an early detection test. Here, the primary objective was to assess how clinicians would evaluate a signal positive result. This is a, a whole new territory for us. Secondary endpoints were really the test performance, things like sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value. Over 6,600 participants age 50 and older uh, participated in this study. Uh, a test was, a blood test was administered. R return of results occurred within 14 days. And then um, those with a signal detected uh, cancer had a clinical workup by study physicians based on the test results and this likely organ of origin uh, that was suggested by the test. But unlike the cancer seek study, uh, the study did not have a prescribed requirement for PET scans. Many of these folks did get PET scans, of course, but the workup was really directed by a physician. And one of the objectives of the study was to determine how physicians would approach the care of these patients. All participants are being followed for a full 12 months, just like in the other study, that follow-up is not complete yet at this point. We were able to report the preliminary results of this study at the ASCO meeting this year. Uh, these results reflect the experience um, of the first um, 65 patients who achieved a diagnostic resolution, in other words, a decision whether they have cancer or not, after a signal positive result. We had 92 patients with a signal positive result in this study, about 1.4% of participants 65 have achieved diagnostic resolution and the remaining were still being evaluated at the time of this analysis. So a couple of messages from these data and I'll just look again at the very right-hand column. First of all, the chances of having a 
signal positive result was 1.4% in this population of patients. And I think that's important. People go into these tests uh, worried that there'll be a lot of positive results that are going to be confusing. And 98.6% uh, of our participants received a reassuring result. The positive predictive value so far was 44.6%. Uh, and um, that uh, represents about a 50-50 chance of having a true positive result when a signal positive result uh, uh, emerges. And then at the bottom, you can see data on the accuracy of cancer signal of origin. So was the test correct in telling us where the cancer was? It was correct 85% of the time for the first call and 96% of the time when we considered the most likely and the second most likely test uh, cancer that the test identified. Now, this is, a, again, a busy slide. I just wanted to share all these data with you. Um, this looks at, in detail, the kinds of cancers that we were able to uh, detect through this kind of screening, the stages and types and so forth. So what you can see, first of all, on the left-hand side, a broad range of cancer types, colorectal, liver, head and neck, pancreatic, ovarian, lymphoma, so on and so forth. Um, down below, you can see the distribution of the stages. And so amongst those patients who had a new cancer diagnosed that was stageable, it was about a quarter stage one, quarter stage two, quarter stage three, and a quarter stage four. The remaining cases were either not stageable uh, in the case of four of those, they had uh, diseases that weren't um, uh, subject to standard staging and one that was not staged because uh, the patient didn't undergo a complete evaluation. And then we have five additional diagnoses of cancers that were not staged because they represented recurrences of a previous cancer uh, and staging in cancers only done at the time of initial diagnosis. So what we concluded from this analysis is that um, we were able to administer this test safely. We were able to detect a variety of cancers, more than half of them were at the early stages, but follow-up continues. We don't have final data yet. We're going to get more data from the remaining 30 odd patients who had a signal positive result, but hadn't had diagnostic resolution yet. And importantly, we're going to uh, get the 12 month follow-up, see how many cancers we missed and we'll be able to predict, I'm sorry, report a, a negative predictive value as well as an updated positive predictive value. So very preliminary results here uh, for this audience. Um, so um, I think that this, at this point, I turn this slide over to one of my colleagues. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tom. That's such a great uh, overview of the uh, multi-cancer early detection tests that are currently being evaluated. And it's pretty remarkable to consider that, you know, just a few years ago, uh, this was being published in basic scientific journals, and now we have it being evaluated in large multi-site um, clinical trials. And it's thrilling, frankly, to see some of the early results and the fact that, that these tests can work and they do detect cancer. So uh, thank you for that outstanding overview. Um, you know, I think, I think now's a good time to maybe summarize some of the things that we've heard so far. Uh, first of all, cancer screening we all know that cancer screening has reduced cancer death. That's so important, it's impactful and it's exciting for patients. And we also at the same time know that screening can be quite laborious. So the techniques are, are variable and knowing when to screen patients is difficult, knowing who qualifies and uh, trying to navigate the varying and changing screening guidelines is difficult. In fact, less than half of patients um, are really, uh, be detected, uh, cancer patients can be detected with current screening guidelines. So, um, you know, the interest I think amongst providers increasingly is identifying a multi-cancer screening test that would extend to all cancers. Um, and so that's, that's part of what we're talking about tonight. So uh, another summary that we heard is that uh, it's this circulating tumor DNA phenomenon and particularly, uh, you know, some of the methylation marks on that DNA uh, can be used and exploited not only to screen for cancer, to, but also to predict the origin of that cancer. So uh, here are some goals for physicians to keep in mind. And, and we'll use the acronym SMART, which stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Timely. First of all, clinicians, of course, should encourage patients to be up to date with recommended cancer screening procedures. I, I think we would all emphasize that these novel 
blood-based cancer screening tests are not meant to replace currently approved uh, cancer screenings. You, for example, would not tell a patient to skip a colonoscopy uh, if they had already been on a, a, a clinical trial and had a test like this or otherwise um, had a test like this ordered by their physician. These would be used uh, in complement with those uh, currently approved screening tests. Uh, of course, clinicians, as always, should explain the benefits and limitations of the current and emerging screening approaches to their patients. And this is always, you know, this gets back to what Dr. Russell talked about with shared decision making. That should be a conversation that happens between a provider and their patient. And then, of course, clinicians need to interpret multi cancer screening results for their patients. We really need to help patients, you know, take patients by the hand, help them understand what a result means. And I think just as importantly, what it does not mean. And we really wanna help patients avoid the erroneous conclusion that if they've had a multi-cancer early detection test that they are in the clear and don't need anything else. They continue, they should continue to have uh, standard uh, cancer screening tests uh, that are appropriate for their um, age and clinical characteristics. So uh, let's go back now and, and ask a question. Um, and you can submit, you, you've been submitting some of your questions, and I want to address some of these with my colleagues now, Tom and John, uh, your experts in this space, respectively, um, and, and you uh, have enrolled patients on clinical trials where these tests are used, you understand them, uh, and let's think about, uh, you know, some of these common questions that we're getting from the audience. So one that's been asked a few times now is, uh, how often should a test like this be applied? If you have access to, you know, blood-based multi-cancer early detection testing, uh, is that something that you do on an annual basis, every other year, every three years, every six months? Uh, and so, Dr. Baer, what, what would you say to a patient that's asking that question or to a provider who wonders that? Well, I think it's, it's a wonderful question, and thank you for that question. It's, um, it's tempting to say annually. We're just used to annual stuff, right? Um, but I, at this point, we have really no data. I mean, these studies that, that we've reported have taken that, that test into the clinic on a one-time basis. And I personally have some concerns about automatically jumping to annual because when you look more deeply at the data, what you find, which is what you'd expect, that the, the performance of the test depends on the prevalence of undiagnosed cancer. So when you have a test with a specificity like 99.5%, which is what we're talking about with the, the GRAIL MSED. Um, if you have a reasonable prevalence of cancer in, in the population that you're screening, you're going to um, have a positive predictive value of 40 or 50%. And so for every abnormal test, um, half the patients will have cancer, half the patients will have a scare, but no cancer and, and some diagnostic evaluation that perhaps they didn't need. Now, but if you apply that test to a population that has a lot lower incidence of cancer, then you're going to get a proportionally more false positives. That's just how the math on these things works. So the question that I would want to know to answer that question is, what, what happens after the first year? When you screen again, have you caught all those cancers? And the next time, the prevalence of uh, undiagnosed cancer uh, is lower than before. Or you know, is, is a year the right interval and new cancers are developing and that is a strategy to, to keep up with them. So I think we desperately need data on that. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up being annually, but I also wouldn't be surprised if it ends up being every two or three years. It's a balance between the, the interval cancers that can develop between screening tests and the risk of uh, doing this so often that we uh, generate too many false positives. Um, do you have thoughts on that? What uh, you you've encountered this question, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I I think we'll see kind of what the interval is, and and sometimes the default becomes you know every year. But when you look at a lot of the things we screen for, we used to screen every year with Pap smears, and right. that has kind of moved out because you know that last point when I talked about screening is you keep evaluating the data, and you don't want to screen people more often than you need to. You know, we, we want tests that have kind of great negative predictive value, right? You know, the, the, the uh, positive predictive value, when you look at lung cancer screening. So when you look at the big lung cancer screening 
study that led to uh, us having a screening paradigm, you know, there were 24 false positives for every one true positive. When we look at women and get breast biopsies, you know, 10 women get breast biopsies, only one has a cancer. So, you know, we do put people through, a lot of people have colonoscopies and have biopsies that aren't cancer. So, you know, really as, a, as an acceptable thing, I think one of the things as a, as a country we really want is something that's gonna have very good sensitivity. Now, looking at the GRAIL study, um, I like to think of cancers as turtles or rabbits. And, you know, the turtles are kind of slow and I'm not sure how much they do. And, and I view thyroid and prostate as kind of uh, turtles. And maybe that's naivete on my part, but I view them as not ones that move real fast and cause a whole lot of trouble. But the rabbits that move really fast, you know, the pancreas and the bladder and the esophageal, they would have been caught much more often in the GRAIL study. So I am very excited that uh, the blood test is going to go over, go after rabbits more often than turtles, because maybe I don't want to find as many turtles. Yeah, I mean, I think in a research environment, we should do annual tests and see what happens, because that that's the perfect way to see, do we need annual or can we learn from every other year the same amount of information that we learn from annual yeah, so I, I'm I'm eager for us to test these these and answer these questions scientifically. So you know we saw that in uh, particularly in the Pathfinder study there was an age, um, and and so what age would you suggest using as a cutoff, or would you suggest using an age cutoff for applying these tests to patients? Well, I think that that goes back again to the expected prevalence of undiagnosed cancer. So the the uh, fifty year cutoff was really chosen with that in mind. And we, we know that, you know, for the most part, statistically speaking on a population level, cancer uh, is a disease of aging, um, not to say that there aren't young people with cancer. Um, so I, I do think that um, that's a good place to start. And in an evidence-based universe, that's where we have some evidence and to the extent that we would uh, consider younger populations, I'd wanna be thinking about younger populations who have an elevated risk of cancer that might correspond to the general population above age 50. So certainly uh, an important research question would be people with hereditary cancer syndromes um, that are at elevated risk, perhaps people with some exposures. But you know, again, um, uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, of uh, data and, and, um, and evidence, and we just, need to, we just need to ask those questions and answer them. So for now, I really personally would like to stick to the data, and that's 50 and above. And, and Tom, while I have you, so by the way, let me just let you both know, we're getting lots of questions in the chat. That's great. I want to let the audience know, please keep sending in their questions. We're going to do our best to address all of them. Tom, while we have you, um, can these tests detect or predict the stage of disease. We, we see they have this very nice feature where they can predict the tissue of origin. It's, it, you know, you'd get a test result that might say a signal detected, and then it would likely predict, at least in one of the tests, it would predict the source of that, of that cancer. What about stage? Is that possible? Uh, so far, no. Uh, I mean, that, that's, a, that's perhaps a bridge too far. But, but I will say that, you know, one of the really interesting things about these tests is that uh, they're using um, artificial intelligence or machine learning or whatever is the term that you'd like to use to, uh, to develop the discriminatory capacity between signal detected and signal not detected. So there isn't any one marker in the blood or 10 markers that are leading to the result. It's an analysis of over a million markers in each patient looking for patterns. And so I think there's an opportunity as these tests are deployed uh, to a larger scale populations to continue to learn and to continue to refine the test. Perhaps that's something that can be done in the future, but right now that's that's a bridge too far for these tests. Yeah, you know, here, here's something for, for all of us to consider. I'd love to hear your thoughts to start, John, but you know, one of the audience members is wondering about whether these screening tools could uh, replace colonoscopies and mammograms. And you know, would that ultimately save money for the system? So we talked before about these not these tests not really being ready to replace standard screening tests. We wouldn't do that today. 
do you see that as a future possibility? John, what do you think? I mean, I, I guess we'll see, right? You know, I, I think as data pours in, I think we'll find out, you know, the acceptability of colonoscopy isn't for everyone, right? And not everyone is willing to do a prep. Not everyone lives in a place that has colonoscopy available locally. In small town USA, people might need to travel. Um, so, you know, I, I think we'll see, you know, it's, it's hard to really start tearing down some of the uh, things that we have right now that we've kind of found that work pretty well. And I think, you know, some of the problems with breast and colon cancer screening in the United States are the people who are not screened. Um, but, you know, I think we have lots of alternatives with regard to colon cancer screening, but maybe in one day we will find that this is uh, a test that will, people can have a blood test and not have to take off work and not do preps and things like that. But I think, I think that's a ways from now um, because I think we have kind of things in place and I think it's gonna be a while till you have the data to say, this is superior to an existing uh, testing paradigm. We don't have a testing paradigm for pancreatic cancer. Yeah, I think so, if I could just jump in on that one because it's such a great question. I think this is one area where you know, theoretically, I completely agree. I mean, we have a stool-based DNA-based test for colorectal cancer. It's not a replacement for colonoscopy, but it's, a, it's an initial screening test that some people rely on. So it's theoretically possible. But if there's one area that we're gonna have some data on, it's this area, because all these studies um, are requiring and re strongly encouraging participants to continue their standard um, screening tests. So we're gonna know how many screen-detected cancers were found after a negative uh, Galeri or cancer seek result. And we're gonna be able to speak to that pretty clearly. I'd, I'd also just wanna remind our, I think as, as John said, we have level one evidence of a survival advantage with some of the well-established screening tests. That's not something that we would wanna abandon lightly and without uh, uh, evidence uh, that is really, really strong. You know, John, you alluded to small town USA and, you know, patients may not have equal access to standard screening tests in an era of, uh, you know, improved attention to socioeconomic factors, or at least we have a responsibility to continue to improve our focus on that. Do you see this, this kind of blood-based multi-cancer early detection testing as a way to um, mitigate some of the disparities that we've seen in the past in healthcare? Yeah, you I mean... I think acceptability. I think a blood test is going to be acceptable to people in small town USA. And certainly if people could have that negative predictive value, so people have a test and are kind of reassured, um, I think that that could really go a long way for people who don't have access uh, to a lot of the other things. Now, it partly is going to be the false positivity, right? So if I've got to drive three hours for a PET scan, and, and there's a high false positive rate for some of this test, maybe that's not gonna, maybe that's not gonna tip to the balance to small town USA. So I think, I think the evidence is gonna kind of push us kind of one way, but equity is certainly a problem. And if you looked at the cancer screening I talked about, the higher the income and the higher the education, the more likely someone was to get screening. So there clearly is inequity in cancer screening as we know it right now, for the, for the five, six cancers we screen for in the United States. Tom, I'm wondering if you could repeat for the audience the positive predictive value of these tests. And you know, one of the audience members astutely pointed out that you know, the worry about having a positive test and scaring a patient, right? Or this audience member even points out the, the fear of being accused of malpractice. So would you like to speak to those points and maybe remind us of the PPV? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's when I first um, started working on the Pathfinder study, I, I, I think I shared the, your audience uh, members' anxiety about what, what it's going to be like to work this up and figure it out. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that one of the things we should start with is that uh, the signal positive results um, in the um, GRAIL study were found in 1.4% of participants. And with the updated tests that we're moving forward with in Pathfinder 2, we anticipate that to be around 1%. So 
99 out of 100 folks who avail themselves of these tests will get a reassuring result. I think that that's a really key number. So whatever we talk about is, is, is uh, what happens in one out of 100 patients. Um, and uh, for so far, it looks like the positive predictive value of a gallery test is around 45%. We still have some folks to analyze and we'll see where we land. It's gonna be somewhere in that neighborhood, maybe 40%, maybe 50%, but somewhere in that, in that area. Um, so what that means is roughly for every uh, cancer we diagnose, we have one other patient who went through a diagnostic evaluation and, and we did not find cancer. For cancer seek, the PPV was 20%. So that's uh, one cancer and four false positives. And for, as, as John alluded in, in his earlier presentation, for current standard tests, um, the, the false positive rates are actually quite a bit higher. Now, they're, 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 they depend on how you count them. You know, in mammography, is it, a, is it a, a very serious concerning lesion or is it just an abnormality that needs to be followed up with a, a repeat imaging study? So, uh, but, but they are uh, typically, you know, positive predictive values range from five to 20%, depending how you define each test uh, for most of the existing tests. Uh, so uh, we're used to dealing with, with false positives and screening. These are a little different and new, but they're not, um, you know, an extraordinarily different problem than what, what we've been dealing with, with standard screening as well. You know, I was really thrilled to see a positive predictive predictive value of 45% in the Pathfinder study. Um, I was also, I've been very interested to see the sensitivity results depending on the, you know, they really depend on cancer type and on stage. One way that I like to think about this is that my current sensitivity for detecting a pancreatic cancer in a patient by physical exam, which is the only real screening tool that we have is zero. I, you know, I've never done it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, with these tests are, regardless of their performance, they nevertheless, for the majority of cancers, offer a screening test where we've never had one. Yeah, and I think, I think um, uh, as folks consider using them, understanding their performance characteristics by cancer type is gonna be important. So they might be multi-cancer early detection tests, but their performance for ovarian cancer is very different than for thyroid cancer. So I think knowing what the tests can do is gonna be important in how we recommend their use. Well, John, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this very common clinical scenario. And we've had multiple audience members ask this, what do you do when, and you know, all three of us, I know firsthand dealt with this during the Pathfinder study, but what do you do in a scenario where a patient has a positive blood test and then you do follow-up imaging and that imaging is negative? Do you have, do you have a suggestion for how to manage that? You know, I, I think you're going to just kind of go into it that that people are going to have some false positives and you're going to, it's going to point towards, you know, working up this, this one or two areas for looking at a cancer. And I think then you're going to have that follow-up screen, right? So if someone's going to get tested again in a year, right, we have people who have, or at high risk for lung cancer, who would get another CT scan a year from now. So um, they might be people I would, uh, maybe put some kind of reminder to make sure that they have some uh, follow-up test for this. And um, because I, you just want to make sure it's not an early signal that's going to turn into a positive signal. So that would be my, my kind of take on it, but I probably wouldn't keep throwing darts at the dartboard for a year. Yeah. Anything to add there, Tom? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've, each patient is a unique experience here. Uh, you know, we uh, at, at OHSU, we, uh, we enrolled over 1,700 patients into Pathfinder 1. That was 27 folks with a signal positive result. And um, uh, amongst those was um, you know, approximately 10 that had a positive result and we didn't find a cancer in. There were a handful of folks in whom we found a precancerous condition that we were pretty confident was uh, was the reason for the test being positive. And, and th those counted as false positives, but we had an explanation. And so for those remaining patients, it was really uh, one patient at a time clinical judgment. You know, there was a couple of patients where we repeated the, um, 
the test. And uh, in at least one case that I can recall, it came back normal. So that gave me some confidence that it was a false positive. Uh, we did thorough evaluations for the suspected cancer. So if it was breast cancer, we didn't stop at a mammogram. We might've gotten an MRI or an ultrasound if it was appropriate. But if we did a thorough clinical workup uh, that we were confident um, was um, had examined the organs of interest, you know, we provided the patient with reassurance and knowledge and a follow-up plan, and and um, uh, and you know that was the approach. It's it's not all that different from having um, a, a ditzel on a CAT scan for lung cancer that you're following up because you're not sure what it is and you don't think it's worth subjecting the patient to, um, to a videoscopic uh, thoracoscopy or whatever, um, but you still have a, a little bit of a, uh, an issue to, to check on in the future. It's, it's about the same. You know, we developed at our institution a workflow where when patients had a positive result, they were referred to oncology. And that was largely the request of our primary care physicians. And then actually over time, they became more comfortable and we found that when a patient got a positive test result, the primary care physician initiated the workup until there was a, a clear diagnosis and then they were referred to oncology. So I think it's a question of developing a workflow that, that um, is manageable for your specific institution and situation. I had patients myself who had a positive uh, blood test and negative imaging and we did what both John and Tom suggested. We you know, each case was individual. We followed them up as we thought was appropriate based on their specific risk factors. So um, here we are, we're, we're coming right down to the end of our time here. I, I just want to mention, you know, someone from the audience pointed out and we should highlight that in fact, these multi-cancer early detection tests do detect late stage cancers at a higher frequency than early stage cancers. And um, there are other tests being developed for mon to monitor for cancer recurrence. And that's not the intention of these uh, screening tests. And so you, you would hear more about that in uh, another setting. So um, I just want to now transition and thank our outstanding faculty members for their participation in this, uh, in this um, uh, CME activity today. Um, I also want to um, uh, thank John and Tom for the discussion that was great. Uh, you know, we addressed a lot of the questions from the audience. We didn't get to, to all of them, um, but I would like to invite the audience to visit CME Outfitters Oncology Hub to access additional activities on relevant oncology topics, as well as resources and patient education materials. And lastly, to receive CME or CE credit for this activity program, please complete the post-test evaluation. And then, and you can do that online. Um, and, and you can also download and print your certificate immediately upon completion of that post-test um, evaluation. So again, uh, Dr. Russell, Dr. Bear, thank you for your discussion, for your expertise, for your insights. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. Have a good night. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.